Welcome to this fifth lesson on situation ethics and here we're going to look at torture because we have to be able to apply situation ethics to one ethical issue of our choice. I'd like you to watch this video by Michael Sandel who is a leading ethics professor and in it he goes into a lot of detail about the issue of torture in general and looks at it from both deontological and consequentialist viewpoints. So go ahead and watch that now and then come back to this video. Now we can sum that issue up really by taking it away from the specific case that Samuel was looking at and looking at it more generally. And this is a very famous problem in ethics, applied ethics, called the ticking time bomb case. And this is um, where we imagine that we know that there's a terrorist who's planted a nuclear bomb in London, we've captured the terrorists, and for the sake of this hypothetical argument, we take it as granted that torture is guaranteed to provide the information that we need to locate the bomb. So the ethical issue is simple. Should we torture the terrorist if we know it's going to save thousands, hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of lives? Is it okay to torture if the consequences are to save millions of lives. And to think about that a bit more deeply, imagine this is London and you're faced with this, this decision and you know that all around the city in, in Covent Garden, people are meeting for a first date. Um, in Mayfair, there's a children's party. At St. Thomas's and St. Guy's Hospital, there's a maternity ward where loads of little babies are just starting their life. Should we torture the terrorist in order to save these people's lives? Or are there some moral lines in the sand that we can never cross no matter what the consequences? So let's look at Fletcher's theory. Remember, he prioritises love. So if we're bringing this up in the exam, if this is an AO2 question, if this is an AO1 question, we need to talk about the different types of love and say that Fletcher is going to predicate all his thinking on agape. The next thing we do is talk about the four presumptions and we link them clearly and explicitly to this dilemma. So, positivism's easy, it's always going to be the same. We say, Fletcher is starting off by saying agapeistic love is the telos of ethical decision making. It just is because he's a Christian. The next thing is pragmatism. Fletcher wants a situation that's going to bring about the best result. He's going to make a decision that brings about the best result. It might not be a perfect decision. For instance, it might involve torturing someone, which isn't great. But he's going to come up with a pragmatic solution, one that works. Next thing, he's going to be relativistic. So he's not going to create moral rules that apply in all places and at all times, like the, like the Ten Commandments. Instead, he's going to say, no, let's make a decision that works for this moment. And then finally, he's going to be personalistic. He's going to put people first and their interests first. If we go deeper into Fletcher's theory, and you would have to do this in, in the exam, we need to now flag up the six principles. And a neat way of structuring this essay might be to either um, focus on two or three in a lot of detail, or superficially run through all six. If I superficially run through all six, this might give you some idea about the ones that immediately leap out to you and that you could really get your teeth into in the exam. So for this dilemma, um, remember Fletcher is saying only one thing is intrinsically good, namely love, nothing else at all. So we don't need to worry about human rights legislation or the Constitution or even the Ten Commandments. The only thing we have to think about is love. Everything else can be forgotten, and this is now the second of his six fundamental principles. We only need to think about love. Third, love and justice are the same. So we need to think, is it more loving to save the city of London from destruction or to protect the human rights of this one terrorist? What is allowing us to spread love out the most? That will be the just action. Number four, love wills the neighbour's good, whether we like him or not. 
So just because this terrorist is clearly a bad person, that doesn't mean that he has no rights. And as a, a situation ethicist, we will have to care about his rights and his life. Even though we obviously don't like him, we do still have to love him. But we need to balance that off with the fact that we have to love everyone else who's going to be in the blast radius. We have to also think about their good. And that might outbalance the terrorists' interests. The fifth principle is that only the end justify the means, nothing else. So we have to think, who's being hurt by this? Remember, it's a personalistic theory. And if it's one person versus a whole crowd, a whole multitude, then maybe torture is justified in this case. Because acts are justified by their consequences, by their end, nothing else. For Fletcher, if we don't torture this terrorist and we allow all the people in the picture and many more to be killed, then we may have committed a morally bad action because it wouldn't satisfy the other criteria. And then finally, love is going to decide there and then. This is going to be a situation-based approach. Fletcher is never going to say um, it is always okay to torture and he's never going to say it is not okay to torture ever. He's going to make a situation-based approach. Now, finally, having looked at the four presuppositions and the six fundamental principles, some things immediately stand out. Firstly, there are no rules to follow. Fletcher says that this is not a substantive ethic, but it's a mode, it's a means of solving moral decisions. So, for us, looking at this case, the torture case, it looks as though torture is going to be okay. It's always going to be an it depends because Fletcher doesn't believe in prefabricated moral solutions. But in this particular specific incident, it looks as though he would allow it because allowing torture seems to be the most loving thing. The problem here, of course, as you might have seen as we looked at the four presuppositions and the six fundamental principles, is that this is not giving us a clear answer. It is unbelievably vague. Now, for Fletcher, that's fine, because this is an ethic for a man come of age. He thinks that people are intelligent enough, savvy enough, loving enough to be able to use this to solve moral problems. We might look at it in a critical way and say it's too woolly and too unhelpful, particularly at a time of in intense crisis like this. On the other side, we could say Fletcher is focused with bringing it about good results, about improving the world, about focusing on consequences rather than rules. And maybe if we had an MI5 officer making decisions based on Fletcher's principles, the City of London survives. And maybe that's better than allowing a whole city to be destroyed to satisfy a rule, which would be the case if Cardinal Newman was in charge. So, that was a very quick look at how we could apply uh, Fletcher's situation ethics to a moral dilemma. You must be really clear in the exam that you can do this for a situation of your choice, a dilemma of your choice. It's up to you, but I recommend this because it's, it's clear enough to be able to describe quickly but complicated enough to allow you to demonstrate both the strengths and the weaknesses of Fletcher's situation ethics.